I opened my eyes, and then I rubbed my eyes, and then I sat up in an instant, and I looked at the clock, and I couldn't believe it. And I, I jumped out of bed, and I started to panic, and I ran down the hall into the bathroom. I couldn't believe it. I was throwing water on my face. I was brushing my teeth. I began to sweat a little bit. I had never had this happen before. This didn't happen to me. I, it, it, it was something completely foreign. It was my freshman year of college, and I'd completely slept through my alarm. And I was going to miss my first class of the day. And into the bathroom walked another guy from down the hall. And he looked at me and he said, are you sick? And I said, no. And he said, dude, what's wrong? And I'm like, I overslept. And he said, so? I'm like, what? It's like, who cares? Do you have a test? No. What class are you missing? Speech? Were you supposed to give a speech? No. Go back to bed. What? You, who cares? And it was like I had an epiphany in that moment. Now, you've got to understand, before I started school, I got the pep talk that a lot of parents give their kids. Were, and, and my, I was so blessed to, to grow up in a family where my parents paid for my undergrad completely. And so I was incredibly blessed. And before they left school, when they dropped me off during move-in weekend, they said, now we're paying for this education so long as you get good grades and you apply yourself and you do what we expect you to do. And that, that was ingrained into my head. And here I was merely a month later, and I had the epiphany of, if you're in speech class and you're not given a speech that day, and all you have to do is listen to everybody else give speeches it's okay if you skip that class. It doesn't really matter. And all of a sudden, I felt relief come over me physically. Now, parents, if you're college-age students here and you're paying for their education, I'm not telling them to skip every class that they're supposed to go to. Let me clarify. If you're in college, go to class. Even if you're not given the speech in speech class, at least until you've used all your skips. Uh, but listen, go to, go, to, go to class, apply yourself. But I just found myself there, and I was freaking out over something I didn't need to freak out over. It wasn't a big deal if I missed that class, and all of a sudden I felt a physical reaction when the older guy from down the hall just said, it's not a big deal. Relax. You're going to be okay. It happens. And it changed my whole day. Gone was the panic. Gone was the worry. Gone was all the stress. And in the grand scheme of things, he was absolutely right. I still passed speech. I didn't use more than my excused number of absences from the class. And it wasn't a big deal. In fact, the only reason I remember that encounter is because I remember how upset and stressed out I was, and how immediately, when he came and provided some perspective, I was able to relax. This morning, we're going to wrap up stressed out, and we're going to see a scene where Jesus was talking to his disciples about spiritual matters and about following God, and it's recorded for us in, in the book of John. If you have your Bible apps on your phones or your tablets, you can follow along in John 14. We're going to start in verse 25. Otherwise, you can follow along on the screens. But as Jesus is talking to his followers and his disciples about spiritual matters, this is what he says to them. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And this has implications not just for the disciples and the immediate audience that Jesus was speaking to, but this has implications for all of us as well. If you are here and you are a follower of Jesus, understand you do not go through life alone. You do not walk through life disconnected. In fact, just the opposite is true. 
You have the most fabulous connection you could ever dream of. You are literally connected to your creator. You are literally connected to God. At the moment you make the decision to follow Jesus, God's spirit comes and resides within you. So God is alive and at work within you the moment you make the decision to follow Jesus. This is the promise of the Holy Spirit, and he is given to those of us who have made the decision to follow Jesus, and his work is one to guide us and to help us remember. In the same way that day that I woke up freaking out because I had missed a speech class, and I was in a panic, and I was sweating, and I was flustered, and I was frustrated, and I was worried about everything, and somebody who was older and had a different perspective came down the hall, saw me, intervened, and reminded me of something, and also told me something new, and completely changed my outlook. That is what God does within us. And his spirit that has come and resided within us. The Holy Spirit is at work within those of us who have made the decision to follow Jesus. And his work is to be a guide and to help us remember. To be a guide and to help us remember. And I know a lot of times it feels like we're walking through life alone or isolated. And it feels like we've got to bear all of these weights and all these burdens on our own. And we have to endure all these things that the world throws at us by ourselves. But I want you to understand, nothing could be further from the truth. You have an advocate that is literally alive within you. And not only is it just some advocate, you have God, if you've made the decision to follow Jesus at work and alive within you, to guide you and to help you remember. And then Jesus says this, Peace, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. The mark of Jesus, he says, I am leaving you with peace. And, and he contrasts it with all that this world has to offer. And he says, for, for those of you who follow me, here's what I give you. I give you peace. Not what this world offers. I offer you peace. And so we've seen through the course of this, stressed out, how Jesus told his followers, don't worry about the things that so many people spend so much of their life worrying about. About food. Don't worry about food. About the clothes that you wear. Don't worry about all of these things that stress you out, that stress so many people out. Don't buy the lie that our society sells so frequently and tries to get everybody to buy. Don't do it. Jesus says there is a better way, but he says you need to change your perspective in order to receive that better way. And he says, so instead of building a kingdom here, instead of trying to impress all of your neighbors and all of your friends and all the people that you'll never meet, instead of trying to do all those things and all the stress and anxiety and worry that comes about from that, instead do this. Seek first God's kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God. So we saw we have to get a different perspective. Because if we keep the perspective of this world, I promise you this, we are inviting stress and worry and anxiety upon us. And rather than accept the peace that Jesus promises us, we drown out that peace and we push it away. And instead we choose stress, worry, and anxiety. And none of us, none of us would say, you know, peace is available, but I just like the alternative. Being stressed out just feels so good. I mean, granted, if you're trying to lose five quick pounds, I understand why you may make that decision. But unless you're trying to lose five quick pounds, sweat all the time, then binge eat, and then worry about it, and then not be able to sleep, you're going to say, I choose peace. I choose peace. 
That's the choice that's available to those of us who made the decision to follow Jesus. We literally have peace promised to us and available to us, but in order for us to accept it, you have to understand, and this is why we started there. This is foundational. We have to change our perspective. We have to change our perspective. And then after we change our perspective, we saw, and this is really crazy, but we saw that hard times and bad things that happen to us can actually be good. That when we walk through experiences that nobody would want to go through, we aren't masochists who say, oh, I just love being in pain. I love having to go through all of these horrendous, horrible things. No. But with a different perspective, we can see how God meets us in those horrible, horrendous moments. And how they don't scare God off. And in fact, he goes to work within our hearts and within our lives in the midst of those horrible, horrendous times and uses them to change us and mold us and help us grow. And once we have a different perspective, then we can more easily persevere through those hard times. And then we saw last week how anxiety doesn't have to define us. How we can make the choice to say to anxiety, no. No. And instead of carrying everything on our own, instead of feeling like we have to just power through and be stronger and get through it, instead of that, we have the choice that instead of us carrying all of our worries and all of our anxiousness, instead of us having that burden, we can instead give it to God. And give those things over to Him. And today we see that we have a promise. A promise of peace. Those of us who follow Jesus, this should be a defining characteristic of our lives. Peace should be something that when people look at us, they see that we are at peace. And it doesn't mean that we're never going to go through hardship. It doesn't mean that we're never going to go through times that we wish we didn't have to go through. It doesn't mean that we aren't going to face situations and circumstances that do stress us out. But it means that our lives don't have to be defined by those moments. And we can walk through life with a certain certainty that nobody who Nobody who doesn't follow Jesus can fully understand. This is the promise of God. This is one of the defining characteristics that Jesus has left. And he says this, peace, peace I leave you. Not what this world has to offer you. No, I'm giving you peace. And so the question I have for you this morning is, is your life defined by peace? If you've made the decision to follow Jesus, is your life a life that is defined by peace? Because it should be. And you don't have to walk through life alone. Because if we did, quite frankly, none of us, none of us could ever arrive at a place of peace. And this is what's so crazy, is we convince ourselves that we could arrive there on our own. And oftentimes, it's in the form of finances. We convince ourselves, if I only had more money, that would be the gateway to peace. Talk to anyone who gains more money. And here's what they'll tell you. That with more finances, with more money, does come a level of more comfort. But there's also a lot more stress, anxiety, and worry that never entered the equation before their wealth situation changed. I don't know what it is for you 
But if you keep chasing after something and saying, when I arrive there, I'll find peace. Peace will always elude you. And there will always be a new challenge. Peace is the promise of Jesus to his followers. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. There's a spiritual aspect to all of this in play. Jesus is departing. He's about to go and he's about to pay for the sins of myself and you. He's about to go pay for the sins of the world. He's about to go be crucified on the cross so that we could have a relationship with our creator. And when he goes and he dies upon the cross, three days later he would raise again, proving that he was victorious over my mistakes and your mistakes, proving he was victorious over my sin and your sin, proving he was victorious over death, proving he was victorious over all things. And then he, after he rose again, he stayed for a period of time, and then he went to heaven and instead sent his spirit to reside within the hearts and the lives of his followers. There is a spiritual aspect to all of this. And if you're here and you've not made the decision to follow Jesus, this isn't going to compute. It's, it's not going to fully make sense to you because you're missing a key component of this. And that's the work that God does within those of us who make the decision to follow after Jesus. And Jesus says, there's a spiritual dynamic to all of this that isn't going to make sense to people outside, but this is the plan, and this is what's going to happen. He says, and now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. This is told for our benefit. The divine curtain isn't always pulled back for us. In fact, normally it isn't. Normally God operates in ways that we have to scratch our heads and we have to be amazed when we see God work, but we're like, how did God do that? And here Jesus is pulling back the divine curtain in a way that it isn't all going to make sense to us because we aren't on God's level. And yet he's pulling back the curtain and saying, this is what's about to happen. This is how I'm going to operate. That God is going to reside within his followers. And then Jesus says this. I will no longer talk much with you. For the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. But I do as the Father has commanded me. So that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise. Let us go from Jesus said, Satan's coming and he's going to do his best. The devil's on his way. Evil's about to blow up. But it has no claim on me. I'm bigger. It doesn't matter. And in a world in which we live, we see that Satan's done his best. The devil continues to work. Evil continues to blow up. We see it over and over again. Everywhere we look, everywhere we turn, all of our lives have been impacted to one degree or another. Some of us in ways that are unspeakable. Some of us in ways that have just made us a little, a little annoyed. Some of us in ways that have been a minor inconvenience. Whatever the case may be, all of our lives have been impacted by this. All of us have seen it on display. We've seen the evil that has come, and it just continues to perpetuate, and it continues to grow, and we see it on display. And yet Jesus says... None of that has any control over me. Go in peace. These words, this promise, Jesus, is delivered just before. He would go to a garden. A garden named Gethsemane. And in that garden, Jesus would take his three closest friends. 
and he'd ask them to pray for him. And he went off by himself and he began to pray. Because hours later, Jesus would make the ultimate sacrifice for all of us. And as Jesus began to pray, he prayed with such ferocity because of the weight that he was under that he literally, his body literally began to produce blood. Hours later, He would be betrayed by a friend. He'd be arrested. He would go to a trial where he'd refuse to defend himself. He would be presented in a poll of public opinion. And the crowds that just days before worshipped him would turn on him. He would be beaten. He would be ridiculed. He would be mocked. He would have a cross thrust upon him and told to carry it to his own execution. He would collapse along the way. And need someone else to help him with the weight. He would arrive at the scene of his execution. They would take nails and they would drive him into his wrists and into his feet. He would die an agonizing death with criminals on either side of him one of whom would continue to hurl insults and mockery. And yet the most painful part was every mistake I've made. Every fault of mine Every poor choice that I've chosen was put on him. Because God loved me. And it was a debt that I couldn't pay. Because there's a cost for mistakes, there's a cost for failures, there's a cost for faults. And it's a high cost. It's death. And God's a God of perfection. That's it. You either make it or you don't. You're perfect or you're not. There is no good enough. And the problem for all of us is we don't make it. Because we could all say, well, look, I know a lot of people, a lot of people that I'm better than. We could all say that. If we're being a little more honest, we'd all say, I know a lot of people who are better than me. But God's standard isn't good enough. As if there's some scale that as long as you do one more good thing in your life, you're okay, then bad. It doesn't work that way that all the good cancels out all the bad the standard of perfection. And 
And none of us measure up. But Jesus did. And God in his love took all of my mistakes, all of my sin, all my failures, all my faults, and he threw it on Jesus so that he could be my advocate. And he would pay the price that I couldn't pay. And that cost which is death, was paid for all of us on that cross. Hours or a day before, Jesus looked at his followers and he said, Peace is what I leave you with. Peace is what I give you. We have to understand that if you want to experience peace, it starts at the cross of Jesus. You can chase so many other things, but they will always leave you empty. And no matter what you put out there as the standard and say, I will finally be at peace when I achieve this, you will find if you achieve it, it will not fulfill you. And it will in some way bring even more stress and anxiety upon yourself if that is your standard. Peace starts with a relationship with God. And the reason for that is because it's why we were created. We were originally created to have a relationship with our Creator. And our sin and our mistakes, we messed all that up. But Jesus came to make it right. And the reason that he offers us peace is because he restores us at our core to why we were initially created in the first place. For a relationship with him. His suffering. His death. provides a way for our peace. And until we embrace that and follow Him, peace will elude us. Because this world doesn't offer it. Jesus says, here's the contrast. I offer peace. Not what this world offers. And the question is, for each and every one of us, Have we accepted that offer? If we have made a decision to follow Jesus, then we need to change our perspective. And we need to remember what really matters. And only after we do that can we then understand that even the hard times that we face can actually be good for us and that God can do something within us and then all the stress and the anxiety that comes upon us we don't have to carry alone 
But it starts here. And it starts with this promise that Jesus made. On his way to his worst day. So that Jesus' worst day could be our best. And we could live in a world of chaos. A life of peace. God, I pray that your peace would define your people. For those here who've made the decision to follow you, God, I pray that their lives would be one that are defined by peace. Give them a new perspective. Help them see even the hardest of times that they walk through can be redeemed and used by you. God, all of their anxiety and all of their stress, let them hand over to you. And God, for people here who've never made the decision to follow you, I pray right now they'd make that choice. as they see all the world has to offer, they would finally say they've had enough. And they would embrace the peace that only you can give. So God, in the quietness of this moment, in the quietness of their heart right now, I pray, God, that they would just acknowledge their sin and their mistakes before you. That they would come to terms with the fact that you love them so much that your son Jesus would die on a cross for them. That he would be victorious and raise again three days later. They would just give you control. And in that instant, their problems won't disappear. The hardship of this world won't fade. Stress and anxiety won't be gone as if some magic trick has just taken place. But your spirit will arrive within them. And there will be a confidence and a comfort and a peace that they don't have to walk through life alone. Give us peace.